prostate cancer. Well, there is some news here. First off, uh, it's a second most common malignancy in men. Second most common. Uh, it's a frequent cause of demise, unfortunately. But we're working on that and we're improving it, and the key to its improvement is early diagnosis. Well, what's PSA, prostatic specific antigen? Want to know what it is? It's called a glycoprotein. And those cells we were talking about in the prostate, they produce the seminal fluid. PSA is part of the seminal fluid, and some of that leaks from the prostate to the bloodstream. So, PSA is prostate specific, not prostate cancer specific. But prostate cancer produces a lot more PSA in a given volume of prostate tissue. So that's where we see if PSA is rising, we become suspicious there may be something going on. And one of those things that could be going on is prostate cancer. On the other hand, enlargement of the prostate, benign enlargement, also results in more PSA. So your PSA can creep up and you can have just benign enlargement of the prostate. So if you want to be specific, um, this is the bottom of the range, 0 0.04 nanograms per mil. When you're above 20, most of the time, at least for me, I'm saying there's a prostate cancer. If you have a PSA less than 10, there's a good chance you're early in diagnosis, but it's a lot better if you get the PSA somewhere between either 2.5 and or 4 and 10. This is a much more desirable place to be working with PSA. PCA3, this is the new kid on the block. It's not yet approved by the FDA, but we've hinted to it in these discussions in the past about new marker agent for prostate cancer. Now, PCA3 is a genetic marker, and the cells, the same cells we were talking about that produce the seminal fluid, are shed from the prostate, and the chemistry, if you have the right immunoassay, you can pick up PCA3 in the urine. Now, you, there is PCA3 in the urine in the normal state, but when you have a prostate malignancy, the uh, PCA explodes. There's a tremendous change in the volume of PCA that's produced in a malignant prostate, and it doesn't have to be a big malignancy, it can be a small malignancy. If there's a malignancy in the prostate, there's a very good probability that you'll be able to find an elevated PCA3. And I anticipate that PCA3 plus will obtain FDA approval within the next calendar year. Prostate examination? Well, we talked about the fact that you can feel the prostate. You know it's supposed to be soft and symmetrical. Movable. Uh, if there's a malignancy, you should be able to feel some alteration if there's a significant volume of malignancy. Prostate biopsy. This is uh, an ultrasound system. In this case, uh, this is not a small one, it's a pretty good size, you can actually see it. Now, you can use other technologies with ultrasound. One is called color. Doppler, another one is power Doppler, and they will show color related to blood flow. If you have new growth of cells, you have blood vessels supporting it. And with Doppler or color Doppler, you can actually identify those blood vessels. Here's a tissue specimen, and this happens to have a malignancy in it. But I think the real message here has to do with uh, <coughs> imaging and being able to recognize angiogenesis, new growth in the prostate. Radical prostatectomy, it's 
probably the gold standard for treatment of prostate. It means taking the whole prostate out. A robotic prostatectomy, and you can put uh, what amounts to a laparoscope that's controlled by a computer in the puncture wounds, and you can do the things that you can do with an open prostatectomy, and that is loosen these tissues that hold the prostate in place. You can mobilize the prostate, free it from the bladder, and then you can connect the bladder to the urethra and reestablish the urinary system. This is the prostate, and we have obviously nerves that support uh, erection and, and uh, sphincter function uh, at really at both levels, and there's a fair number of veins that are associated with it. So you, you have to have a pretty good concept of what's there and how you're going to deal with it in body prostatectomy. Here, uh, this system is basically a guidance system for <coughs> laparoscopy. This is the prostate, these are the nerves, blood vessels. And these are the arms that we can control with the computer to do the, the section. And then the prostate can be removed and then the urinary tract can be put back together again. Uh, but it is radical prostatectomy and the sphincter muscles and the nerves and all the structures <coughs> still are moved around and have the potential <coughs> to be disrupted to some degree. Minimally invasive approach. <coughs> you can use radio frequency, but that's not really there yet. You can use very cold temperature, that's called cryoablation. That is here and now. And basically what happens is we deliver very cold temperatures, we freeze the fluids within the cells, and it destroys the cells. And these are the blood vessels that supply the area that you freeze, and you actually thrombose the blood vessels so there's not good flow to the vessels, through the vessels to the cells, and so the cells in those areas die. This is argon, which is a cryogen. You can generate a temperature of close to minus 220 degrees centigrade. And this is helium. You run this through this same needle and you can generate heat. This is <clears throat> ice being sculpted to the prostate and we're talking about total prostate ablation here. And this is where the whole <coughs> prostate is frozen. This is the ice ball. Uh, within just a very few millimeters of this frost front, the temperature here is minus 40 degrees or colder, and all metabolic activity ceases at that level. This is a cancer of the prostate that was treated and then with cryoblation, and this was a biopsy taken uh, three months later. <coughs>